Well, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, the topic I, or the, the theme I chose was how to avoid the truth about climate change. And, and the reason I chose that was because until a few years ago, that's exactly what I was doing. I was avoiding the truth about climate change. Now, at the time, here were my sticking points. I thought that there was lots of scientific controversy still going about, on about how much humans are contributing to climate change. I thought that climate projections, uh, so over the next hundred years or more, uh, were based solely on complex computer models of physical systems, which I knew from professional experience were easy to screw up and badly. Okay, and also add in that I knew there's always uncertainty in science, so putting all that together, it was easy for me to just dismiss the whole thing and say, well, it's all so uncertain, uh, we, we can't really come to any firm conclusions right now and then just leave it at that, okay? But uh, for several reasons, I started really reading a lot more about this topic. And I found out fairly quickly that it wasn't so much that all that stuff I thought before was wrong, it was that I was missing a whole lot of information. I found out, for instance, that there is almost no scientific debate anymore about whether humans are largely responsible for the temperature rise, at least over the last 50 years or so. I found out that there are other ways to estimate climate sensitivity, for instance, from paleoclimate data, um, that give about the same answers as the models. So they're estimating how hot it's going to get um, based on data, not just models. And I also found out that, yeah, there's still a lot of uncertainties in these estimates, but it's mostly on the high end, given the data we have now. So that it's almost, uh, I mean, it's the chance that the climate sensitivity to greenhouse gas forcing is so low that we don't have to worry about our greenhouse gas emissions is vanishingly small. I'm talking about a few percent chance, and that's being generous. Now, I'm not going to be focusing mostly on the, the science aspect of it today. I'm going to be talking about how people like me avoid the truth. So this, uh, the, my target audience, I guess, is people like me and people who want to understand people like me. How do we go about so effectively avoiding the truth about this issue when, uh, honestly, the evidence is really piled much higher on one side? Well. Boiling it down, here's the answer, so you can leave after this slide if you want, but, but the rest will be examples. First, we tend to believe what we want to hear, because we're, we're people, right? That's what people do. If we're presented with information that, uh, that seems to go along with what we already believe, we accept that pretty easily, and if we're uh, confronted with information that uh, challenges what we already believe, then we have a much harder time accepting that. The second thing is that there are always truth-challenged individuals, I'll call them, who will tell us what we want to hear to promote political goals. Now, when I say truth-challenged individuals, I'm not uh, using that as a euphemism for liars, because I came to realize after it took me a year or two of this, uh, to realize that most of these people actually believe what they're saying. It's just that they're much worse than the rest of us at this. They only believe things that, that uh, um, go along with what they already believe and ever, just dismiss everything else. So they, th that's what they do much more effectively than the, most of the rest of us. And then when they talk about it, they sound so sure of themselves. And so when the rest of us are kind of unsure about it and we hear this person talking about it that so, sounds so sure about it, then we tend to, if they're saying what we want to hear, we'll go along with them and, and think we have a good basis for that. When the media gets involved, the way they report on things like this uh, is that they make little or no effort to determine who's probably right. And so people came, come away with the wrong oppression. I'll, I'll uh, talk about that some more later. Um, but then also, most people, including a lot of scientists, uh, have naive ideas about the nature of science, so how science works and how it should work and so on. Now, let's talk about the first one, what we want to hear. Now, it turns out the, the number one predictor of what any of us believes about global warming uh, is our, pol our political persuasion. Uh, 
So this is from one of the latest polls here. Uh, people were asked, do you think that global warming, it, warming is happening? So they're not even whether humans have anything to do with it. Is it happening? Well, when 78% of the uh, Democrats say yes, and 53, but only 53% of Republicans and 34% of Tea Party, of, uh, people affiliated with the Tea Party, you know something's going on, right? Uh, it's our political biases. I happen to be uh, politically conservative. And so for me, when, when people like me, when you hear about some big environmental problem like this, the first reaction is always, oh yeah, those environmentalists again, right? <laughs> They're exaggerating again. And does that ever happen? Sure it does, right? It, it does happen. So there's an element of truth to it, but it's sort of still a knee-jerk reaction where we're not looking into it in more detail. Okay, here, let me go back for a second. This is Newt Gingrich a couple years ago before he totally flip-flopped on this issue, explaining the problem for conservatives. Let me explain partly why this, is, why this is a very challenging thing to do if you're a conservative. For most of the last 30 years, the environment has been a powerful emotional tool for bigger government and higher tax. And therefore, if you're at the minute you start hearing these arguments, you know what's coming next, which is bigger government and higher taxes. So even though it may be the right thing to do, you end up fighting it because you don't want the bigger government and higher taxes. So I thought that was a good uh, explanation of what's really going on in our minds. Um, now, when the media gets involved, there's a problem with how they report things. And this is really well summarized by this uh, leaked memo from Bill Salmon, who was the Fox News Managing Director in Washington, D.C. Um, he says, given the controversy, uh, this is what he told his staff, by the way, given the controversy over the veracity of climate change data, we should refrain from asserting that the planet has warmed or cooled in any given period without immediately pointing out that such theories are based upon data that critics have called into question. It is not our place as journalists to assert such notion, notions as facts, especially as this debate intensifies. So what he's saying is it's not their job to make any determination who's telling the truth. We'll just report that uh, he said this and she said that. So they think of this kind of he said, she said reporting as fair and balanced, right? But in reality, um, when that's all you present to your viewers or to your readers and you don't give the full arguments for both sides, uh, you're not letting them choose between uh, what they think is, you know, you're not letting them make an informed decision. What you're doing is just um, giving the false impression that there's a bunch of people who say one thing and there's a bunch of people who say the opposite thing. So uh, why don't you just believe whatever you felt like in the first place, okay? Now, this is a well-known problem. And there's been academic studies published about this. This one, for instance, by Max and Jules Boykoff called Balance as Bias, uh, examined the US prestige press. So the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And some of these media outlet, outlets are known to uh, lean a little bit to the right, and some lean a little bit to the left. But the problem is across the board, this kind of false, falsely balanced reporting. So they examined the store, all the stories about uh, human-caused climate change that all these papers covered, and over half of them um, exhibited this kind of false balance where people could easily come away with the idea that uh, there's equal numbers of people or about equal numbers who believe one, or the, one side or the other. Now, the problem with the media goes far beyond that, though, in some cases. Uh, you'll get cases where people won't just give the false impression that there's this big debate going on in scientific circles. They'll actually come out and say it. Okay, so for instance, three months ago in the Deseret News, they published this article, that study showing that uh, global warming and climate science is far from settled. And the Daily Herald, our local paper here, went even further. Uh, just last month and said, uh, the, talk, they talk about the phony consensus on climate change. Oh, there's no consensus. Where are they getting this idea that there is no consensus about climate change? Um, this is where our truth-challenged individuals come in. That's where they're getting this information. 
Because the fact is, there is a strong consensus about climate change. Uh, people have done academic studies where they've done scientific polling of the experts. And it turns out that 97 to 98% of actively publishing climate scientists, people that everyone would agree are experts in this subject, um, they agree that humans are causing significant climate change. Also, there have been, uh, there's been this study here by Naomi Oreskes, who's a prominent science historian, who showed that um, there are very few peer-reviewed publications about original research that question the consensus about climate change, whereas there are a lot that, that go along with it. So in the face of that, if you're a truth-challenged individual who doesn't, you don't want this information to get out, really. I mean, you will do anything you can to put up whatever smoke and mirrors to give people the impression that there are these droves of, of scientists out there who agree with you. Because if you don't do that, it's sort of like this. Would you ever see a commercial like this or an advertisement like this saying one out of 33 dentists recommend chewing sugarless gum, so buy Trident? No, you would never see that because what would you be thinking if you saw this? You would say, well, what are the other 32 out of 33 dentists saying? Is there some problem with, uh, with sugarless gum? So you'll never see this. The strategy. First thing you do is broaden the field of experts and peer-reviewed scientific literature to include things that people wouldn't normally include, okay? So you have bigger numbers, and then you do petitions and lists rather than scientific polls and surveys. The idea is you want big numbers, not percentages, okay? So if you can get a big number of scientists or a big number of publications uh, that's, and to wave in front of people, that's more impressive than if you say, well, 3%. That's not impressive at all. Okay, so this next one is an example um, from Fox News. This is a clip of John Coleman, who's the founder, uh, one of the founders of the Weather Channel. So he's a TV weatherman. Well, now there are 30,000 of us. Mm -hmm. We have 30,000 scientists, 9,000 PhDs, who have signed up to debunk global warming. And you notice he also said that he was going to sue Al Gore for fraud. Anyway, 30,000 scientists, that's a big number. You can wave in front of all the Fox News viewers and some of them are going to be impressed by that. But if you look at the details of this petition, it's usually referred to as the Oregon petition. Um, it was, again, a petition, not a poll. So just get as many people as you can to sign it. And to, to sign it, you just had to claim, nobody's gonna check, but you just had to claim that you had a bachelor's degree or equivalent in science, math, engineering, health, something like that, right? So if you look at the details, which they published, uh, only about 40% of them, or about 40% of them, only had a bachelor's degree or equivalent, okay? Now, if you have a bachelor's degree in something, does that make you an expert? No, it, it means that you have the groundwork laid where you could become an expert if you put in a whole lot more work, right? 48% of them were engineers, excluding environmental engineers, which I thought were a little closer to the right kind of field. But, I mean, if somebody's a mechanical engineer, honestly, would you go to them for advice about, uh, like, whether you need a, a quadruple bypass or something like that? No, they, you would go to them about mechanical problems, right? 8% were doctors or veterinarians. Would you really call your veterinarian about climate science if you had a question? <laughs> so the point is not that, I mean, all these people, yes, they have some scientific training. Would that help them if they wanted to branch out and, uh, and uh, learn about climate scientists? Absolutely it would. Okay, so I don't want to knock that. But if you've gone to all the trouble of becoming an expert in veterinary medicine, that also means that it's very unlikely that you've gone to all the trouble of becoming an expert in something else, especially something as unrelated as climate science. In the end, if you do all the math, it turns out that maybe less than 1% had PhDs in some kind of, uh, of field where we could sort of be sure that it has something to do with climate science. Okay. The problem is, why, why, so why is this impressive to people, 30,000 scientists? Well, because people usually think of, of scientists like this. Do you guys remember 
You guys are probably too young, right? This is a professor from Gilligan's Island. And the running joke was that he could build complex mechanical and even electronic devices out of coconuts and bamboo, but he couldn't fix their boat on this island that, where they were. Anyway, they, people think of scientists as, well, you know about science, so why don't you tell me, right? But in reality, we're, we're much more specialized than that. If you have cancer, you don't go to uh, your podiatrist. You go to your oncologist, right? Because even doctors have all these little subspecialties, and being an expert in one doesn't mean you're an expert in another. Let's look at that other study I mentioned um, by Naomi Oreskes. Now, what she did was search the web of science, which is the standard database of peer-reviewed scientific literature, from 1993 to 2003 for the phrase global climate change. Now, is this going to get every paper on climate change? No, it isn't. But she got a good sample, 928 totally, total articles that reported original research. That's what she was focusing on, not opinion pieces or anything like that. Of those, 75% explicitly or implicitly endorsed the consensus view that humans are having an effect on, on the climate. 25% didn't say anything about it one way or the other. It wasn't really relevant what they were talking about. And 0%, zero papers rejected the consensus. And she was very careful to say that doesn't mean there weren't any papers that uh, went against the consensus. There just weren't any in this sample of 928 papers random sample with just this, uh, this uh, search term. So the, the obvious conclusion is that however many papers there are out there that question the consensus, they are a vanishingly small percentage of the total. There's no other way you could, I mean, it, except some complete freak accident that you could get those uh, results otherwise. Now, how are you going to challenge this kind of information? Because you know Al Gore mentioned this. And so so you got to get Al Gore. Well, one way, this is a very popular website that uh, challenges a Reskis article by saying there are 900 plus peer-reviewed papers supporting skeptical arguments against uh, global warming alarm. Okay, 900 articles, how did Oreskes miss that, right? Well, it's impressive until you start looking at the list. And Maybe for people who aren't scientists, uh, you know, it would seem impressive, but for people who are, like me, I look at uh, most of the articles are, are things like this. An alternative view of climate change for steel makers in Iron and Steel Technology Journal. Does that sound like a climate science journal to you? Doesn't to me. And you look up this guy and yeah, he's a metallurgist. This one, Joel M. Kaufman, Climate change re-examined in the Journal of Scientific Explanation. Again, you look up this guy, he's an organic chemist, but could he have branched out and become an expert in climate science? Sure, but let's look at what kind of journal he's, he's uh, publishing in. Never heard of this Journal of Scientific Explor Exploration. But when you look in the uh, table of contents, you find a lot of stuff like this. An empirical study of some astrological factors in relation to dog behavior differences by statistical analysis and compared with human characteristics. Dog astrology, that's what I'm talking about. And if you look through the table of contents, you can find UFO abduction research, you can find uh, research on alternate worlds being ex that you can explore through taking psychedelic drugs. I'm not kidding about this, but if you want to jack up the number and not talk about percentages of anything, you will accept stuff like this and put it on your list. Okay, so suppose people start thinking, well, they keep saying, you know, John Huntsman keeps saying there's 98% uh, of climate scientists agree about this. What are you going to say? Well, the next uh, tier is science isn't about consensus. And it's usually an appeal to Galileo, right? So here's Rick Perry after John Hensman says his uh, thing. Uh, here's Rick Perry. What does he say about that? And I, and I tell somebody, I said, just because you have a group of scientists that stood up and said, here is the fact, Galileo got uh, outvoted for a spell. Okay, so Galileo, the classic story, right? Here's this lone scientist going against the establishment. He has the evidence on his side, but they are so stodgy and uh, you know stuck in the mud. 
that they won't accept it and they might even throw him in, in prison or I guess he was put under house arrest, I guess, right? So the classic story, bring up Galileo. And the truth is that yes, could there be someone come along and uh, have you know, new evidence that makes us rethink everything? You always have to hold out that possibility in science. But the problem with the appeal to Galileo at first is that just saying, well, somebody might come along and disprove that in the future, that isn't really, uh, really that impressive. So later on in the debate when the moderators asked Rick Perry, well, so which climate scientists work do you follow, for instance? And, and he said, uh, well, there's lots of them, you know. So that, that's not super impressive. So what you have to do, what you have to do is trot out Galileo, right? You have to, you have to produce Galileo. Okay, so one recent candidate was this guy, Roy Spencer. Now, is he, he is a legitimate climate scientist. He works at the University of Alabama, Huntsville. He's one of the few that does go against the consensus, but he has real credentials, and he publishes stuff from time to time that uh, goes against the consensus explicitly. Okay, so for instance, his, uh, one of the books he published, I think it was last year, uh, was the great global warming blunder, how Mother Nature fooled the, the world's top scientists. And if you read this book, um, it's full of stu stuff about how he's being, you know, and like-minded scientists are being persecuted out of the climate science business and uh, you can't get their papers published very easily because um, of all the bias against it and so on. So, so he's totally running for Galileo, right? And what do you know, this year, he and uh, Danny Braswell, his colleague, published a paper in the journal Remote Sensing um, that did, it goes against the consensus, what they wrote, okay? And the headline here in Forbes magazine website is, New NASA data blow gaping hole in global warming alarmism. And this was picked up by Fox News and several other um, uh, news outlets. Okay, so we get this media bubble about this. And this guy could, I mean, he could have blown the whole thing apart until the other climate scientists started looking into what, he had, what they had done. Now, here is a graph I've adapted from his, uh, their paper. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of, the, of their analysis so much. They, they took some uh, satellite data of outgoing uh, radiation from the Earth and the surface a surface temperature record and did a regression between them and lagged the time uh, uh, like between the two data sets by varying amounts. And they get a pattern in the data like this sort of S curve right here. And these right here are patterns that they got from analyzing the output of several climate models. Analyzed 14 climate models that the UN uses, but uh, they only reported uh, the averages of the three most sensitive models and the three least sensitive models. And again, the sensitivity refers to how hot is it eventually going to get for a given input of greenhouse gases. Okay, so you can see here that both of them kind of stink, right? They don't follow the, the real data very well at all. So conclusion number one, the models are, are fouled up. Conclusion number two, here's the most sensitive models, here's the least sensitive models, and way over here, is the real data. So maybe the real climate system is way less sensitive than any of those models that the UN uses, which is something that uh, Roy Spencer has been trying to prove for years. Okay, so the first thing if you're a scientist when you look at this is you notice, wait a second, if you're comparing data sets, that's a statistical argument. Where are the statistics? Where are the error bars and so on? So if we can, we can see whether you know, uh, they really do or whether the difference is really significant or not, statistically speaking. Well, and Andy Dessler at the uh, Texas A&M, he did that analysis. Uh, here he put error bars on the data. That's the dark gray um, area right here. And also, he used another temperature uh, data set. And it turns out that makes somewhat of a difference, which temperature data set you use. That's the light gray area. Now I have plotted the same thing, um, the same two uh, three uh, most sensitive models and the three least sensitive models down here, and they still aren't very good, right? But um, like I said, Spencer and Braswell only gave us the res 
averages of, of six models, right? Where are the other eight they said they, they analyzed? Well, it turns out that some of those other eight really do a much better job at mimicking the data, okay? So here's the average I made of the three best performing models, which have sort of moderate climate sensitivity. And they are within the error bars, okay? So the conclusion you have to draw from this is that this doesn't say anything about climate sensitivity. It has nothing to do with it. And these guys left out data that they said they analyzed, but totally under undercuts their case. Okay, so I'm betting that most of you are thinking what I'm gonna say is, well, this guy, he's not a real scientist. He's totally not objective like real scientists are. And so he can't be Galileo of the new Galileo of climate science. But now I want to talk to you about the real Galileo. He's remembered for the stuff he got right. You know, he was arguing for the Copernican system of astronomy, and he had some great arguments about pendulum motion and about um, he had some telescopic observations that undercut some of the assumptions that uh, uh, some other systems made. Um, and things like that, okay? He's remembered for that. But you know what? He didn't think that those other arguments were very conclusive. There were ways you could get around them and still believe in some of the other astronomical systems that were around. What he thought was really conclusive was his argument about the tides. So, you know, the tide goes in, the tide goes out every day. The thing was that in the Copernican system, it was based on circular orbits of the planets. And we know nowadays that they're more elliptical than circle, circular, right? And so to correct for the non-elliptical nature of this uh, cir circular orbit, they still had to use some epicycles, which were little circles on top of the circles that they used as sort of a mathematical trick to keep the positions of the planets in the right place. Okay, so they still, they, the system had an epicycle for the Earth that would, it would go through every day. The problem with our, this argument, I mean, his argument was that if the Earth is going like this every day, then maybe the water's sloshing around, right? But the problem was that his uh, hypothesis would predict, predict that um, you would have two or one tide, so go in, the tide goes in, the tide goes out once a day. But in reality, it goes in and out twice a day, everywhere, right? So at first he, uh, you know, he knew this was true about the Mediterranean, but he said, well, over in the Atlantic, it probably just does it once a day. But no, that wasn't true. And the more people piled on evidence, the more he dug in. He never rejected this argument. He always thought this was his best argument for the Coper Copernican system. So the idea I'm trying to get across is that we can't dismiss Roy Spencer as the next climate uh, Galileo or anyone else just because they made one or two bad arguments. Even the great ones do that. When you're a scientist, you're always sticking your neck out and you're always risking somebody coming and saying, no, that's really not, not the case. But if gr even great scientists can behave dogmatically, then consensus is crucial to the success of modern scientists. We've always had the loners out there the brilliant loners that come up with some great idea. The problem is that it wasn't a perfect idea. And so it didn't pick up any legs because they didn't have what the modern scientific community has, just the community itself. When a modern scientist uh, presents an idea, even if it's not per uh, perfect, you can bet that there's going to be dozens of people beating the crud out of it. For an extended period until you work out all the kinks, and get it to work better than it was before. That's the difference between just the Greek philosophers and modern science. Consensus. So the people who say that science isn't about consensus, they don't understand science, okay? They're thinking of you know, just lone geniuses out there overturning, uh, overturning things, but the fact is nobody's that good. That's why we need each other. And the other thing the story of Galileo shows is that in the end, you know, once some more evidence is piled on and the bad arguments are swept away, almost all the scientists will eventually uh, change their mind. They are capable of changing their minds in the face of evidence, which is important. They, could be, they can be jerks, they can be, uh, behave dogmatically, 
And yet, usually, most of them, some of them just have to die off, right? But, but most of them <laughs> will change their minds. OK, so what do you do if the Galileo argument fails to impress? You say, who needs experts, right? I have a little clip from the treasure of Sierra Madre. Right? Well, you got a little budget. We don't need no budgets. I don't have to show you any stinking budget. <laughs> we don't need no stinking badges. Who needs experts? That's what this guy sells. So this guy, Lord Christopher Monckton, he is a, a British peer. He is a Viscount. He's a politician. He's a journalist. He is not a scientist. He, he doesn't claim to be a scientist. Um, but he has all these ideas about why climate scientists are, are badly wrong. And what does he do? He says, look, you don't have to believe me. Science isn't about belief. It's about uh, rigorous inquiry. So all you have to do is go check on what I say. Now, this was at UVU right here. Um, a year or two ago, okay? And how many of those people that he was in front of actually went and checked what he said? Not very many, right? So that's how you can get by. You can say, well, is it true that people should be going out and checking for themselves? Of course they should. There's truth in that. But how many people are actually going to do it, right? So if you don't do it, uh, you know, the easy thing is just to say, well, he said you could go check it, so I, I'll just believe it's on the up and up because he was challenging people to uh, go check it, right? So wouldn't somebody do it? Well, the fact is that people have gone and checked uh, what he's done. It wasn't the Daily Herald, right? So after he gave his speech here at UVU, uh, they published this op-ed, or not op-ed, just uh, an editorial about Lord Monckton and liberty, how he's saving us from the communists, right? Um, they were dazzled by this. Here's some of the, the one of the slides he was showing. Uh, it's a graph of the temperature from two, January 2002 to January 2009. And, uh, you know, here it is, and it's going generally a little bit downward, right? But on the other hand, he graphs this pink area right here, this triangle that's supposed to represent the IPCC predictions for what the climate was supposed to be doing during that time. Isn't it obvious? Here's the predictions, here's the reality. So obviously, the models that the IPCC is relying on must be wrong. Isn't it as clear as day? But the problem is, uh, when I started checking into this, I had actually seen what the IPCC had projected for the, the emission scenario he was using. And here it is. So here's the area between uh, uh, 2000 and 2010. Wow, it doesn't look like a little pink triangle, does it? And in fact, if you look at the individual models, uh, they go up for a few years, they go down for a few years. So you could easily have several year period with a downward trend in global temperatures according to the models. But in general, they're going up, okay? So if we plot the range of uh, these uh, models, Oh, I didn't uh, put that graph in there. I'm sorry. If I go back here, and if I plotted the range of those models, it would be like up here and down here, basically. OK? So the, the conclusion is that it's, it's pretty much doing what the models say it should do. And, and if it's going to go off in a different direction, it will take several more years to figure that out. Okay, you, because the climate system uh, on a short term is so chaotic, you can't settle questions like that with just about to seven years of data or so. Okay, okay. When I pointed out, and I found out I wasn't the first one to point this out to him, he published this uh, rebuttal where he said, 
Uh, some have said that the IPCC projection zone on our graph should show exactly the values that the IPCC actually projects for the A2 scenario. However, however, as will soon become apparent, the IPCC's global warming projections for the early part of the present century appear to have been, in effect, artificially detuned to conform more closely to observation. So what he's saying is that, okay, yeah, this wasn't what the IPCC actually projected for that period, but if they'd done it right, they should have predicted what I said, okay? And it turns out he was using the wrong kind of equation. His data that he was feeding into the wrong, the wrong kind of equation was also wrong. And, uh, you know, and so guess what? He got the wrong answer. So this is not uh, somebody whose science you can trust. And it turns out that even if the people at the Daily Herald uh, didn't know anything about the science, didn't know how to go check that data or anything like that, they could have uh, checked into this guy's background. It turns out that he goes around claiming to be a member of parliament. Parliament says he's not, okay? <laughs> this year they actually did an open letter on the parliament website, see, www.parliament.uk, where, where they're trying to get him to uh, stop claiming to be a member of parliament and stop using their logo, okay? That's all I'll say about that. But, but uh, the guy also, it turns out, claims to have developed a miracle cure that will cure AIDS. It will cure HIV. I mean, uh, not HIV, that's AIDS. But <laughs> it will cure MS. It will cure Graves' disease. Uh, it will cure the flu and the cold. And the list goes on, OK? One cure for all of these diseases. And of course, he'll say that, uh, well, he, they're doing scientific tests to determine whether the initial promising results are, are all true. But honestly, before those results come out, is this the sort of person you would go running to to get your science from? But, but wait a second. He said that uh, you don't have to trust him. You can just go check on what he says. But the fact is, like I said, that most people don't. They say, oh, I could go check on him if I want. And then they don't. And then they treat him like another expert. So for instance, here he actually was invited at least a couple times to, to uh, testify before Congress. A fake member of parliament testifying before com Congress who's not a scientist, who is testifying as an expert witness about climate change. Here is Representative Joe Barton, a Republican from Texas, introducing Lord Moncton. one of the most knowledgeable, if not the most knowledgeable um, experts from a uh, skeptical point of view on this issue of climate change. And okay, one of the most knowledgeable, if not the most knowledgeable experts on the subject of climate change, according to one of our congressmen who invited him to testify uh, before a committee of the U.S. Congress. Okay. <clears throat> so here are the conclusions I want to get across from this. Number one, these kind of contrarian objections that people like me put forward, right? I, I used to be uh, taken in by some of this as well. They're almost always uh, have a, a kernel of truth. The truth is that liberals do sometimes spin environmental issues. There are some legitimate climate scientists who object to the consensus. There might be a climate Galileo on the, on the horizon. And non-experts should try to figure out climate science as much as we can. But, uh, or I can add also that there is always room for doubt, especially in science. And everyone has biases, so you know, we don't have to feel bad about being biased people. But when we are turning veterinarians and metallurgists into climate experts, when we're pointing to articles in dog astro astrology journals, when we're putting forward potential climate Galileos who can't put together any decent evidence, 
and when we're relying on a fake member of parl parliament who claims to have developed a miracle cure-all as one of our experts, we're trying too hard. There's, like I said, there's always room for doubt, but there has to be a point, if we're going to make any attempt at all at trying to be objective, that we have to admit that we're trying too hard. And I think uh, for people who were on the same side I was a few years ago, I think we should admit that we've reached that point. Thank you. <laughs>